Hello and good afternoon. My name is Robert Bates and I head up the decision sciences team in Curry's, uh, probably one of the UK's largest electrical retailers. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how we try and unleash decision science within the business. And crucially, the people driven side of it and the role of the translator. Now, before I start talking about the, the translation role, I think it's worth spending just a little time talking about what we really mean by data driven. Because we all work in businesses where we talk about trying to be more data driven. And I think what we, all, what we actually mean by this is about how do we use data as a tool to enable the business to make those better decisions. It's not just about having lots of reports. It's not just about having lots of models. It's about our ability as data scientists, as decision scientists, to be agents of change and really transform the way that business operates. Now, I've been in the business for quite a while. I think I started my career way back in the early 2000s. Um, and since then, the industry has been revolutioned by, by, by new technology. The rate of change is happening, getting faster and faster all the time. Now, when I started, the toolkit was pretty small. I remember doing my first models and, build, and basically having to deal with MS Access and the two gig limit. Excel had 65,000 rows. It, it, I mean, for those people who, are, who don't remember any of that, you're lucky. But it was like the dark ages of data science. We're still trying to work out, actually, we haven't even got to, the, got to the Bronze Age. We're still working with slow tools, legacy IT systems. And since then, everything has changed so much. We've now got far more tools than we even know what to do with. We've got Python, R, we've got, you can spin something up and down in the cloud quicker than you, can do, than you ever could. Those limits on row counts, on how you use the data, the speed at which you can process, they've all gone. But the reality is that what we do within the data and decision science world, it hasn't changed one bit. It's our job to help businesses solve their problems by providing those unique and actionable insights, digging into the stories, finding out what drives something, so that we can actually make their lives, our customers, both internal in the business and external, those using our websites, using our stores, simpler and better. And that, for me, is the heart of what, makes this, what decision science is all about, trying to change the business and work out where we can and can't do that. And as I mentioned, the rate of change of, of technology and tooling is growing faster every day. And those expectations of what we can deliver, they're continuing to grow. At both, ends of the at both ends of the demand spectrum. If you put yourself in the position of business users on your day-to-day -day lives, you've probably have dealt with members of the commercial and business teams, kind of just coming up to you and going, I need to know what's driving something. I need a model for this. Can you just run the numbers, which is my personal pet peeve. What does it even mean, running the numbers? And then asking for more and more details about their own categories, about what's driving something. And on the other side of that divide, I've got my data science team who basically talk a completely different language. They talk about building Bayesian neural networks. They talk about not having the data. How do they find it? I've even had one person tell me, I want to build models. I'm not an analyst. So there's this massive expectation gap which sits in the middle. And what we try to identify within Curry's is how do we bridge that gap and unleash data science? And there's a crucial role which we've identified, which we're, trying to, which we're filling within, within the Curry's data science team. We're after those translators. We're after that layer of people who are going to set the question. It's not just about looking at what the underlying data is. It's about combining that data with systems thinking, breaking that problem down into manageable chunks, which you can then analyze independently. They're people who understand the operations of the business. Because if you're going to be building models, if you're going to be trying to sell things into the business, you've got to have a rough idea of how that can be implemented. And all too often, models fail at the stage. If we build something which is tremendously predictive, but we've never really thought about how can we implement that in practice? How do we get that working? So we're looking for people with that strong business acumen who understand the operating environment and constraints. And finally, we want them to be business partners, working with those operators, refining hypotheses, and translating those problems into plain English, which everybody can understand. Now, from a people perspective, this actually creates a bit of a challenge because you've got your traditional data scientists who are very strong from a technical perspective. And what we found out in Curry's is it's not always about who is the most technically skilled. It's about having those skill sets which balance and straddle the commercial and technical worlds. So we actually operate with a matrix structure within my senior team. 
we've got people who are very strong on customer behavior and loyalty who know how to answer those problems. But they're also, they'll be our go-to person when we're developing those ML models. We've got someone who's business partners on credit and services, very much looking at the product, project planning, the execution side. So we can bring that skill set to keep us more honest and to help us develop those models and those plans better. And finally, we've got people who look at commercial pricing, performance, very different parts of the business, but also are good, very good at visualizing that data, bringing that data skill set to life. So we've got a senior team who can then actually translate those business problems. So how do we put this into practice? The first thing we try and do is we're going to focus upon the problem. Because all too often, we start to go, well, I've got a solution. But we never really think, what is that a solution for? And when we're focusing upon the problem, we're applying systems thinking to understand where the parts of the business are connected. Any simple problem, if we're looking at our customer segmentation, it's related to churn, to experience, to life cycle. All of these parts are connected, and we want to talk to the business as a coherent whole, understanding the linkages, what drives what? How does that problem link into others in the business? And what are those primary and secondary drivers of change? Because when we think about those main drivers, and I've always told, don't put equations up on a PowerPoint slide. But I think here it's actually relevant. Because if you think about the, the complexity of models, something like demand forecasting, there's actually a function of the underlying market trends in there. We talk about the seasonality of demand, the price and promotional response, and that stockholding sensitivity. And if we approach it as a single thing of, I want to build a model to forecast demand, we start to lose the nuances. We start to lose those underlying drivers of what creates the change. Because actually, that's important for identifying the velocity of change within each of those. For example, your underlying market trends, they're not going to change weekly, which means you've got stability in the model you're developing. I have actually seen a demand forecasting model where every week they change the drivers. They change the type of model to get the best fit. So one week my price elasticity was two, the next week it was three. It made no physical sense. So we start to think about the velocity of change because that actually gets us gets us a better output in the long run. The other thing by decomposing the problem is we're actually able to think about where else can we use these in the business. So just because I'm doing something on demand forecasting, I can actually think about the underlying market trends of element for business planning. My price and promotional response should be dictating my promotion cycle, optimizing my commercial offer. Seasonality is incredibly important for marketing campaigns, for staffing levels and budgeting. And that stockholding impact allows us to think about the inventory management. So by stepping back and breaking down the problem, we can give a coherent solution which is far more powerful for the business than that singular model. The next thing which we're trying to do, and I think it's very important, is focusing upon that Goldilocks zone for anything which we do. Now, I'm going to probably contentious for, for a data science conference, but I personally don't think things are about how accurate a model we can build at the start of a question. Everything for me is about having a model which is accurate enough to create that meaningful change. There's no point going for 95% accuracy if with 80, I can actually change the business decisions with sufficient confidence that it's right. And if we think about this from a timing and a person perspective, actually, when you start off with any, any process, there's a level where the first model you build, it's not going to be the best. So actually having that model costs you money. It's actually a disbenefit against the existing process. And as the accuracy gets higher and higher, you start to see the benefit go. But at some point, you hit diminishing returns. Now, if you, count, if you compare that against the time it takes to build, the time you spend getting a model which is 80% accurate versus 90, 95 and thereafter, you actually find that there's a point of inflection where your level of benefits against the time and complexity, you're, you're, just, you're just spending time. You're in diminishing returns. And so what we try and work at the team thinking is, how do we get that Goldilocks zone, that point where we're starting to see that point of inflection, where actually it makes sense to deploy now? Because if we can identify that right level of accuracy to grant the benefits in the agency, we can actually deploy and monitor, and we can start to use it. We can start to see the benefits in practice. And once something's live, you can optimize it. You move away from the theoretical of I'm going to get a gain of x to I'm actually getting this gain. How do I make it better? And we start to do this by thinking about those clear opportunity statements at the start of any project. So working with the business to say, actually, what do we want to improve? By how much? How accurate is that existing process? So we can set the expectations on both sides. 
If someone says, I've got to be able to predict something with 100% accuracy, we can get not really going to happen. All right, let's rethink it. We can think about how people are going to implement things. How often do those models need to be refreshed? Actually, what data sources do you even need to keep it running? Because if you do that, it's so much easier to get the implementation plans at the start. We've all been in modeling projects probably where halfway through, we feel the goalposts have moved. The reality is they've probably never moved. We probably just never wrote them down in the first place. So having that clarity with the business on what we want to do allows us to get a far better product at the end. We can actually, actually start to pick up people thinking about, well, what are you going to do? Right? We've given you the model. If it works, what is that impact going to be? If you're successful, how are you going to take it to the next stage? Because if you're then going to optimize further, it starts to take the types of models which you want to be using, whether you go for something which is more explainable versus something which is more black box. So we consider those requirements early on. Thirdly, we want to focus upon telling the story. Now, this is a genuine quote I had one of my data scientists tell me. So I've built a neural network to analyze browsing behaviors and perform text mining on product descriptions to find similar products to display. Now, that's relatively confusing, even for somebody who's been working in data science for 15 years. It's even more confusing if you're trying to sell that to your internal client. So actually think about the language which has been used to tell the story. What he's really done is they've segmented customers. And they've created some product clusters. And when you start to use that language, when you start to translate it and make it simpler, it's easier to work with the business, say, are we doing something which is right or wrong? Where else is it going to work? Because if you're thinking about segmenting customers, the key questions you're going to ask is, how great is that reach? What are the attributes you've used for segmenting the customers on? Do they make any physical sense whatsoever? How, how, when do we know that information about the customer? It allows you to get a better product. When he was creating product clusters, you've got to think, what's defining each of those clusters? If, I do, if I'm using clustering on my web base, I probably want to be using the same thing for the stores. I want consistency of implementation. I want to be able to translate what people are doing online to stores, to marketing, all over the place. It makes it far easier to review. Because in some cases, if you're using a neural network for browsing behavior, is that even appropriate? How many data points have you got? Are you just doing something because it's shiny, or are you doing it because it's right for the business? And in the case of text mining and product descriptions, we found out the, the person building it already had access to all of the products back. <laughs> so you weren't even using the right way. You basically had the data already. You were running around the corners to go get it. So by translating it, it's then far easier for the business to see what we've done. We got some customer segmentation, some product clusters, and we were using them for recommendations. That then led into a whole set of other questions which we could solve in the business, building those out. And in terms of putting this into practice, I've kind of like spent a lot of time over the last like five, 10 years as things get more and more complicated. of trying to work out how is it you can really kind of get a view for, do people know what's in the models? What's driving them? And within Carries, we come up with a set of four principles which we call kind of fair ML simple questions which we want to ask the people building those models to make sure that the grain's right and they understand what's going on. Now, the first of these is about features and that explainability. So whenever we're building a model, and I'm a big, oh, okay, whenever we're building a model, and I'm a big fan of explainability, we can start to say, what are those main features and attributes which are driving those models? Because if we understand what's driving them, there's two quick checks we can do. The first one is, do they make physical sense? If you're explaining this to the end user, to the business user, is there anything which stands out? Anything which looks really weird, which you probably want to recalculate on? You also start to think about, well, how well do you know their future values? It's very easy to build models historically which have got great accuracy, because you know everything. You've got perfect recall about the past. That's why we talk about hindsight being a great gift. But if you're looking at a complex model which, looks at, which requires the competitive pricing position, you don't know what that's going to be three weeks out. You don't know what it's going to be two weeks out. So you quickly start to think about, are these suitable drivers for a predictive model versus decomposing what's gone on in the past? And then you think about, can we even simplify those usage? So again, talking about that, I've built some random customer segmentations using browsing data. Well, actually, do I already have a customer segmentation which I could be using? 
we then start to look at actually the simple questions of agency and accuracy. So how accurate does the model need to be? And crucially, what agency are we granting that model? What independent decision-making abilities are we giving it? And therefore, what is the risk of being right or being wrong? There's a lot of areas where it's easy to accidentally outsource the agency. So things like if you're doing competitive pricing, it's very easy to suddenly give a model or predictive model powers to set the prices. That's something which, as a retailer, you should always be cautious about. So we look at reining in what that agency is. And this then begs the question of, well, do we, re do we even need to use AI? Because in a lot of cases, simple, just simple predictive models can be done on if, that's an if this and that basis. And that's by actually spending the time working out what that accuracy is, what that agency is. We can get a better product for the end user, something we can deploy more comfortably across the whole business. And we can maintain better control of, of, of any of that AI or, or ML tech stack. We also then start to think about, as I mentioned, that systems thinking. How is everything connected? What is the insight and interoperability we can get from our models? There's so much information hidden within them. The coefficients, the relationships, whether they're positive, whether they're negative, how the business is responding. That actually we should be looking at sharing these, applying them elsewhere in the business. As I mentioned with demand forecasting, we've got a great demand forecasting model for predicting whether, how our products are going to sell, where they're going to sell. We can actually start to use that for doing sales decomposition and identifying where markets are over or underperforming, where we might have a stock challenge somewhere because we can see that, it's giving, that the model is behaving very differently. That starts to allow us to, to look at what is causing it. All of these different things come from just simple questions. And then finally, when we're talking, the, the R in the, in the fair, is think about that reach and responsiveness. Does the model make enough, dis, enough influence, does it influence enough decisions to even make it worthwhile? So how many customers or how many, how many processes does that model touch? What's the frequency at which it's interacting with them? And what's the benefits from them? Because data scientists are scarce resource. We don't have, I, don't think I think, don't think any company really has enough of them. So we want to make sure we're using that resource where it's best for the business. And by thinking about what that reach is, we can actually start to go, well, actually, if we take the model at a slightly, slightly higher level, does that actually give us a better outcome? We can suddenly influence 10 times more customer decisions with a slight drop off in accuracy or inference. We can also actually think about the acceptable latency. How quick do those systems have to be? Where does it actually have to sit? Because we talk about near real-time personalization in a lot of companies. That needs an awful lot of data plumbing and data engineering. So how do you get that working effectively? So by applying these fair principles, we're able to actually look at the models from end to end of, is it working for us? And how do we make that better? And by bringing that together, uh, finally, the last thing I say is, this, this, is, this is a screenshot I got from, from JetBlue years ago. JetBlue's marketing campaign in the States was simple. It was, without you, we'd just be flying a bunch of TVs around the country. And I think data scientists is pretty much the same. If we haven't got those end users bought in, if we're not influencing those decisions, we're just building models. Now, that might be great for some of us. It gives us something to do. But the real power of data science is actually when you influence those decisions. It's about changing the way the business operates. It's about translating the problems and unlocking that value so you can continually demonstrate a return year after year to your key customers and actually build that demand holistically within the business. And so by applying all of these, practi these, these practices within Curry's, we're able to help everybody enjoy amazing technology, not just like our, our internal customers, but by making our lives easier for our customers when they shop online, giving them better product recommendations, understanding what that demand is going to be like 12, 13 weeks out, so we get better stock scheduling, better forecasting. And all of that combines to kind of truly unleash data science and decision sciences. Thank you.